In 2008, burned out from too much confrontation and selectivism and clicktivism and just doubting the effectiveness of many elements of conventional activism, Sarah Corbett started looking for alternatives. And that's when she discovered craftivism. And Sarah realized that craftivism could offer what she'd been looking for, a form of gentle protest. Sarah, who is an award-winning campaigner with 30 years of practical experiences as an activist, uh, defines craftivism as a tool to engage people in social justice issues in a quiet, non-confrontational manner involving beautiful gestures of defiance. And it's amazing. Sarah has spoken all over the world. She's given several TEDx talks. She wrote a book called A Little Book of Craftivism and another book called How to Be a Craftivist, published in 2017. And she hosts these workshops around the world. Oh, and by the way, Malala has attended one of her workshops, so no big deal. And I I first got to have a conversation with Sarah on the podcast, this episode you're about to hear, a few years ago. And since then, uh, I've gotten to spend time with Sarah. I've gotten to learn a lot more from Sarah. We hung out for a few days in Atlanta, and that was so fun. And she has just become somebody I deeply admire And I'm just trying to learn a lot from her, from this conversation and from her book and the things she shares on social media, because I think activism is so important right now. And I think it's so important that we use all the tools at our disposal to communicate about injustices and to steer public officials and world leaders and people in power towards doing good in the world. And oftentimes when we think about activism, we think about the loud forms of activism. We think about protesting and picket signs and chanting. And all of those things really do move the needle. And I think we've seen that in the last three years. But there's something to be said for gentler forms of activism as well. And I've been trying to keep that in mind as I've gotten to have a number of meetings with people in power. I've spent a lot of time in the last few years getting to have conversations with my uh, elected officials. I've had a few meetings with uh, my senator's offices and my congressman and former Speaker of the House Paul Ryan's office. And about six months ago, uh, if you follow me on Instagram, you saw this. I had a meeting at the White House with the vice president's office where I got to very clearly articulate that the White House needs to step up its game in regard to foreign assistance and the global impact the U.S. can have and should have and try to appeal to perhaps some of the values that the vice president and his office claim to support. And I knew that I couldn't go in there and loudly protest the injustices of their lack of impact. And so I sought a more gentle form of doing this. And for that, I read Sarah's book. Uh, I reread her book again because I had read it the first time and it's just filled with dog-eared pages and I love it so much. And following her advice on the art of gentle protest, I think has moved the needle in a lot of these meetings and is done so in a way that I think is unique to this format. And so Sarah is somebody I admire. I wanted to revisit this as we kind of enter the next political election season because I think that there are opportunities for all of us to move the needle with candidates who are running and it's a lot easier in the primaries. And I also think that we're just in a time where we all are paying more attention to what leaders are doing, whether they're the leaders of corporations or our elected officials or just people in power. And so I think that we we all have the opportunity to learn from Sarah and the art of gentle protest in finding unique and creative ways of communicating these ideas. And so if you're new to Sounds Good, I'm Brandon Harvey. This is Sounds Good. This is the weekly podcast where we have conversations with inspiring people who are rejecting cynicism and using their lives to make an impact. As a reminder, we are taking a break from releasing new episodes for the next several weeks while we work on something really exciting for this podcast. And so uh, we're sharing a few of our favorites, and I hope that whether you've heard them before or this is your first time hearing them, they move the needle for you. They are helpful that you enjoy them. And so without any further ado, this is my conversation with the wonderful, talented, and brilliant Sarah Corbett. All 
Okay, remind me again what time it is for you. It is seven minutes past 2 p.m. So it's perfect time and for my brain to wake up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, in Which city are you in again? I'm in London. London. Oh, my yeah, gosh. I'm in East London. London is so amazing. Well, okay, here's the thing. I just went in to go say London is so amazing. I've never been to London. Have my wife not? speaks so highly of it. I've got so many friends from there. I've never been. Oh, well, you've got to see it like lots of little villages. It's not one place. It's so much like, you know, messy little villages and every part's different. So it might overwhelm you. So you've got to pick which little villages to wander around and get to know. Otherwise, it's just too big. It's just too overwhelming. But I love huh. it. I'm such a big girl. I like the hustle and bustle. So when you say villages, is that the equivalent of like a neighborhood or is it or is it kind of a different feeling than that? Yeah, no, neighborhoods that have got their own identity and their own little communities. And, you know, you've got, I mean, like any big city, you've got a financial sector and more of a creative sector and, you know, more places that are more leafy with kids and other places where I am, where it's like creative freelancers trying to, you know, just about pay their rent and cling on to staying in London when rent is just ridiculous at the moment. So, yeah, it's a real mix. And I love it. It's so diverse. So it's very Good. accepting. And for me, moving to London, I was in Liverpool and Manchester and places. And I'd always say, like, I'm going to do this zine or I'm going to do this project. And you'd never do it. Whereas in London, people are like, have you not done it already? Like, everyone's really encouraging you to risk things and try new things and be creative. And it's a very special place for me. Yeah, it's home. Do you feel like being around so many creative people, it feels competitive or collaborative? Not competitive in a bad way, but it, it makes, I think it makes me personally feel more, it's less risky because I'm like, my friend's just done something and she wasn't named and shamed and some of it worked, but she learned from it. Or you see someone else doing something and it gives you the confidence to go, if they're doing it, maybe I could have a go. And there is, I mean, I've been in London nearly 10 years and it does, you know, it can take a long time to feel part of a community and a tribe and different friends, but it's definitely makes me not lazy because it's such a fast paced life. And I love that. Lots of people don't, but it's so creative and people are always trying things out that I think it just, it's like osmosis for me. It just makes me go, why aren't I trying out all my ideas? Everyone else is. I might as well. It's a safe space to do it. You know, I make stuff that is still hidden under my bed that I wouldn't show anyone. (laughs) But I think think living in London makes you like want to tinker around and try things. And, And on your doorstep, like I went to this incredible musical about the Beastie Boys and it was tiny (laughs) in this tiny venue with four actors. And it was, I mean, I'm I'm not into, I don't do theatre, but it was so creative with the lighting and, you know, minimal props and tiny space. And I was just like, this is amazing and reminds me how beautiful the world can be as well as, you know, how there's injustice in it. But it just showed me like what people can do and how creative people can be using their gifts and talents and passions. So, and I don't think I'd have seen that play if I wasn't in London. <laughs> Yeah. It's very, very niche. <laughs> totally. And I like that you brought up that like there's this incredible thing where people can bring beauty and art and creativity to the world in a world that is filled with so much injustice. And I think that's I think in many ways that epitomizes like the incredible work that you are doing as somebody who is a craftivist, uh, which we will get into that. <laughs> but you've got a really unique way of fighting back against injustice in the world through art and creativity and, as you call it, the art of gentle protest. And so before we dive into that, I kind of just want to back up and talk a little bit about protest in general because I feel like 2017 has been the year that at least many Americans have woken up to this idea of protest. They've woken up to this idea of kind of pushing back on the injustices in the world. I know that in many ways I have, but for many, many people, I think protest still has a lot of maybe negative connotations. What is the word 
protest kind of mean to you? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I grew up as an activist surrounded by activists in my family life and protesters who were amazing people and got stuff done and working for the charity sector and trying to mobilize and train people as protesters. Um, I can see how brilliant and passionate they are, but I'm also still one of those people that, you know, at a party, if someone says, oh yeah, I'm going to go on that demo or protest this, my immediate like gut feeling in my body is like, oh no, are they judging me? Or, oh, I just want to, you know, in the book I talk about how I'd be at parties and say my job was an activist manager for Oxfam and people would like glaze over and you could see them saying like, I'm, I'm just going to go to the toilet, lovely to be there. <laughs> and I'd be similar because I'd be thinking, all I want to do is dance to Beyonce and you're probably going to tell me about an awful injustice in the world and how we should be protesting against it and not be at this party having fun. So I always, even though I'm a protester, I always think the worst, which I think is really weird. <laughs> Yeah, which is why I sort of talk about just gentle protest, because if, you know, the crux, the core um, meaning of protest is you're protesting against an injustice, aiming for a better world. So it should be this very positive, inspiring word. Yet often for most of us, it scares people. It scares people off. It makes people feel depressed or worried or judged or shamed. So I think, you know, activism needs a bit of a rebrand. We need to remind people this is a really good thing by thoughtful, passionate people who want to make the world better for everyone rather than like a chore or something where people are aggressive and angry. And hmm, yeah, it's a difficult one. I think there's a lot of um, baggage around that word. Protest. Yeah. Well, and there's something too, I feel like, feel like there's nobody who really likes protesting like i think in an ideal world there'd be nothing to protest and i think that for activists who are protesting things i think you kind of hit this wall where you you burn out and you're like i don't want to be protesting this thing anymore like i want to see change happen and obviously i'm still here protesting like there's not a lot of glamour behind well i think it's, it's one or the other a lot of the time so i remember moving to London 10 years ago and, you know, trying to meet like-minded people. And I was in my early 20s and I joined lots of protest groups as well as it being part of my job. I wanted to be part of movements in London of, you know, like-minded people. And it was interesting because it would be similar to what you said, Brandon, about people, feel, you know, looking tired and worn out and it feeling like a chore. And in a way, protests shouldn't be fun in some ways, you know, because it, this is about injustice and it's about the people or planet being vulnerable to oppression and systems that are stopping um, people or the planet from fulfilling their potential. So if it's fun, it can be bad taste because we're still talking about harm in the world. So I talk about a lot about how activism should be fulfilling, but not just quick, fun stuff. But on the other side, so I met people who were, you know, felt that they had to do it or were directly affected and, you know, needed to stand up. And it can be empowering, especially at the beginning. You feel like, yes, I'm standing up against this. This is a good thing. But activism takes a long time. You know, systems and structures can take a long time to change as well as people's hearts and minds. So it's a long process and it can burn you out. Or we go to the other side of the pendulum in a way where it's it's really fun and people's motivations can be dubious. So I remember joining some groups where one group, for example, bought a tank um, to take to the arms trade fair in London. And I remember questioning them saying, what's the strategy behind this? Because you're a bunch of boys who've bought a tank that you're going to ride to the arms trade fair and you, clearly you're really excited about this and they'd raise money to buy this tank but my thought as a campaigner was what's your strategy this looks like it could be glamorizing violence there isn't a clear ask there isn't making anyone accountable is it it's not stopping people from getting into the entrance it's not a clear visual prop for me to say this is awful I wasn't clear on it and we discussed it and it was basically them wanting an excuse to ride around in a tank. And, and you see it sometimes with violence, you know, sometimes it's young people that just want to throw a brick at a window. Sometimes um, it's people with more of a strategy, but 
my worry with with protest is it can swing one way where it's a complete chore or the other way where it's actually using protest as an excuse to be violent, to shame people, to bully people, to do something fun that they wouldn't do in other parts of life, but because they can give it an excuse and wrap it around in protest, which is a good thing. It sometimes lets people do things that you wouldn't normally get away with. So it's, yeah, it's a messy world. It's all about finding that interesting middle ground too, which which is, you know, a, a central theme, I think, in my life is trying to figure out, you know, what does it look like to be in that gray area between black and white? I think with protest, though, it's not like a middle ground. It's more about what's your motives and if you're and it's based on your principles. So, you know, in the bigger picture, if you want to make the world more beautiful, kind and just where everyone can fulfill their potential and the world can flourish and people in the planet and animals can, then how can you be part of that? system and those how can you be part of the solution rather than part of the problem and sometimes we're both and it's a real mix and you can't be pure but it's rooting it in what's the what's the issue that I'm concerned in and what can I do and then looking at does this fit in with my morals so if I want the world to be a loving place am I doing my protest in a loving way or is it actually contradicting what I'm about and that's what I struggled with a lot of activism was some of it was about ego some of it was about being the hero with a bit of a messiah complex some of it was about feeling that they had to do it and it was a chore you know a real mix of things and I think that Protest can be amazing if we're doing it with the with humility, with love, with aiming for something that helps everyone and not just ourselves. But but often with protest and with anything, it can slip into, you know, the wrong principles. You can slip into being very extrinsic rather than intrinsic in our values. And and that's my worry about some activism is that it can be activism can be very unloving and it can be shaming and it can be, you know, us against them. And I think that's the concern of a lot of people that I meet that because I try desperately to engage people that are either burnt out activists or very nervous of activism and don't think it's for them. I'm trying to say, look, you might think that activism has to be loud, angry, aggressive, you know, divisive. But it doesn't. And actually, to be more effective as activists, we should be kind, thoughtful, see ourselves in this complex mix, compromise sometimes when we have to, but stick to your core values of love, equality, you know, and then and build it from there. That's really good. Oh, my gosh. Sarah, I just I'm I'm loving learning from you. This makes me so happy. (laughs) That was my little (laughs) one. And that reminded me of a question a little bit. You know, you grew up in an environment where you grew up in a family where you were all activists. You now live in a community full of other people who are activists. But I also feel like there's this whole group of people in the world who are not activists and they don't they don't engage in the issues that they care about. What do you think that it is that stops people from taking action? Why isn't everyone an activist? Oh, that's a big one. I mean, there's so many reasons and I can't speak for everyone. I mean, I so I grew up in a low income area in Liverpool in North England in the 80s. So we had a Thatcher government and we had a very corrupt local council. Um, And we only were activists because not we had to because you can choose not to but it was on our doorstep so my dad's still the local vicar there so what you call that in America um reverend or minister I don't know but and he so he lives and works in the community my mum was a nurse she was quite shy not introverted but a shy woman and she had three kids under the age of five at one point and we were all living on the 14th floor of a tower block and my mom it only got political because our tower block would when it was windy it would literally move in the wind and our water from the toilet would swish out into the bathroom so it was not a safe place to live and there was lots of small fires and the lifts the elevators would break so my mom remembers speaking to the firefighters who came to do some checks and said you know what do we do if there's a fire And they said to her, you're fine. If you're on the 10th floor or below, we've got ladders, you're fine. And she is a very shy woman, was like, 
I live on the 14th floor with three little children. Um, and she was already nearly having a breakdown because having three young kids on the 14th floor of a tower block, quite stressful. And a very, you know, my dad's jobs not pay well. So it was always scrimping and saving. And she remembers saying to him, what do we do if, you know, if we're on the 14th floor? And he didn't know how to respond. He just looked at her. So she and other members of the Tower Block um, residents got together, formed a community group to say, what are we going to do? We need to make this safer. Um, and did and started slowly doing lots of activism with housing associations to make the block safer. There was lots of issues around health and housing in our community. So we squatted in a row of social housing that was going to be knocked down to build a park that if anyone knows low income areas, you know, building a park and moving generations of families away from each other um, and creating a park that would have made the area more unsafe and um, was not a good idea. So it wasn't them saying, this is what we're going to do like a career. It was, everything was reactive and growing up around that where there was constantly community meetings in our kitchen over food and um, where we'd be squatting in social housing. And I'm an introvert, but I love listening. So I'd listen to all these conversations growing up where it would be, who's got the power, who's the decision maker, how are we targeting them? But also my dad being a vicar, you know, uh, we had a giant poster of Martin Luther King on our wall, who for me is still the best activist in the world in terms of his strategy and his love and, um, and such an intelligent human being who refers to science and philosophy as well as his faith and we lived in a in a very um white working class area so we didn't see many black faces but we always our campaigning was always around how do we do this in a loving respectful way but still rightly be very angry about injustice and angry that people were labeled and that we didn't have a health center when other areas did we didn't have places where you could buy fresh fruit and vegetables everything was frozen food and so there was there was lots of stuff on our doorstep, and then when I was eight, I was um, went to South Africa with my family for my dad's sabbatical. So for a few months, we went to see what communities were doing. It was the year after Mandela got out, so what they were doing for community cohesion. So very unusual background, um, and I'm very privileged in lots of ways to have that, and I feel a responsibility to to try and help people engage with activism in a strategic way because I know that it needs to be strategic. But at the same time, I totally get how people don't want to get involved because it is the long haul. It's not a quick and easy thing to do. You have to make a commitment to some point to say, I'm going to be part of this change because activism is complicated and strategic, it's quite difficult. So people often go, I want to be part of this, but I don't know how. And I'm not sure where I can be of best use. Um, so it's so complicated and I don't have time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ignore that for the moment and just sign my petitions. So I think for, for me, I, with my work and with the book that I've done, I really want people to say activism can be really fulfilling. It's really good for your mental health to feel part of something bigger than you and something positive. But there's so many ways to do it. You know, for me as an introvert, I burnt out in all this extrovert activism. So I had to find another way. And a third to a half of the world's population are introverts. So I also had that injustice in me of thinking, this isn't fair that introverts are not being offered a chance to use their gifts and talents in activism. A lot of my friends aren't activists, and maybe that's a failure on my part. I try and turn them into it. But the people I naturally congregate with are introverts are creative people that often you know you're in your flat on your own making things people that don't like conflict it, I really don't like it people that aren't competitive and don't want to take power away people who naturally like I naturally don't want to protest I get nervous of challenging people because it's a very vulnerable thing to do yeah so I do want people to stand up but I also want people to do it in a beautiful kind and just way because I think not only is that a nicer way to do it it's a more strategic way to do it um, and if you're not directly affected by injustice it can actually make you really powerful I do a lot with politicians and business leaders where we campaign and 
what really scares them often a lot of the time is not the people who stand up who are directly affected by an injustice. It's the people that have nothing to do with it. And you see it in politicians' faces. They suddenly go, why do these people care? And if they care, maybe other people care that aren't directly affected. And maybe this is bigger than we think it is. And you see them, you know, I meet a lot of them in person. You see them going, oh, bleep this is bigger than we thought it is or this is connecting to people that we didn't think cared that much so for me in terms of strategic activism as well it's like I really want to engage these people that aren't directly affected and bring them in and see that and show them how much power they have because they don't have to struggle directly with this oppression and the other thing is you know grow up up in Everton people are still surviving and you know when you're surviving on not a lot of money especially with lots of the austerity measures coming in I don't think it's fair when people say those people who are directly affected should do all the campaigning of course they should be heard and I always make sure that people directly affected are treated with dignity and are heard and uh, you know get a voice to talk about what they're going through but it's not fair to say you're going through a really, you know, you're struggling through life with a lot of stress and a lot of in oppression. And now you've got to fix the problem that you're, you know, affected by. I don't think that's a very loving thing to do. So I'm really keen that we bring in people who aren't affected to say, because you're not affected, you're really powerful. And that's an empowering thing for them to know. But also you might have um, an opportunity and more time and energy to help be in solidarity with these people directly affected so that there's this real, you know, you feel part of this bigger community and this bigger strategy. And I think that's a really, hopefully, and it's attractive thing for people to know that, you know, if they want to make the world a better place, which most of us do, they can do it in lots of different ways that is realistic and sustainable, but also hopeful and beautiful and fulfilling. You know, I think activism can be, amazing for everyone but at the moment we we see it in a very different light okay this is all incredible and it reminds me of in your book you talk about how nelson mandela when he went to prison for the first time like he went to prison believing in violent protests he he believed in this you know angry protest and 27 years later you know the year before you visited south africa you know he left prison believing in this art of gentle protest. And and you talked about King, but, you know, Mandela and even Gandhi, like they have done this so well. And me and my team at Good Good Good, we've got so much admiration for all three of these folks, among other people who, you know, use this beautiful, gentle protest to bring attention to issues. And I think it's, oh my gosh, it's so effective and so amazing. I would love for you to give a little bit of an example of, you know, what this looked like for you contrasted with like maybe the alternative, you know, what the opposite of gentle protest. Yeah. I mean, the first thing to say is I came up with this phrase gentle protest because I think we just discussed protest can be a really good thing, but it's often the default is that it's not gentle. And I'm not talking about gentle as weak or passive, but gentleness in terms of doing things with lots of love, but very carefully done, lots of consideration and compassion. And gentleness is a very powerful word, I think, and a quite difficult thing to do. And I still get people now, you know, I hashtag lots gentle protest. And I still get some people now going, oh, we can't do protest gently. That's ridiculous. There's so much injustice. We should be angry. And, you know, we need to start with anger. If we ha- We should be angry about injustice, but anger is supposed to be a catalyst. It's not supposed to be something that we constantly use and channel. And it's bad for our health. I mean, I'm lucky that in my work, I've I've been able to work with neuroscientists and clinicians and and therapists to see how we can use creativity for critical thinking and self-care and that sustainability. And the gentleness, I think, is really is what I thread through everything. Um, But it's sticking a little bit. People are getting to know it. But when I say immediately, you know, who were the best activists in the world that made huge change? 
it's mostly people, for me, it's all the people that did nonviolence loving stuff. So I talk about Martin Luther King and Gandhi, but also Rosa Parks, who desperately didn't want to stand up. She, you know, she was picked by Martin Luther King to say, we think you're the perfect person to say no to standing up on the buses when you're told to move. And you're the perfect person because people won't expect you to do it. You're a quiet woman. You're respected in the community. You're not going to scream and shout the fact that you're quite softly spoken actually gives you more strength because people will see that you're standing up not because you like a spotlight on you but because you genuinely care so the more I research about activism throughout history and in different contexts the more I see the power of gentleness and quiet conversations and intimate discussions with power holders so one example and it's the biggest example in the book it goes through over a couple of chapters I go through all of the strategy for me of where gentle protest can work in one context and it works in lots of different ways but one was that I got um, I got an email from the CEO of an incredible charity in the UK called Share Action, who do shareholder activism. So you buy a share and as a shareholder, you go to the AGM and you say, I care about this issue in this company that I'm a shareholder in. What are you going to do about it? And I got an email from the CEO who privately, I'd she's one of my sheroes. She's one of these amazing activists that I followed for years because she's done some brilliant activism. Um, so I got a bit starstruck, Brandon, and was like, oh, my word, she's emailed me. And she emailed me saying she had a copy of my little book, which is called A Little Book of Craftivism. And she said, we're trying to get one, one of the biggest UK retailers in the country, has the most shops in the country. All we want for three years is to have one meeting with their CEO to discuss whether they could be a living wage employer and we've got nowhere and we've done demonstrations we've done petitions we've done all of lots of traditional activism and she basically said your book is so weird there's five weeks before the AGM can you do anything and that's the annual general meeting where shareholders go to where the board go where high up staff go and where media go as well so there's there's just under a thousand people that go in London in a big venue So I had five weeks to come up with a plan and I thought, okay, so if the CEO of the company isn't listening, who's above the CEO? It's the board members. Board members tend to not be targeted in campaigns because we often forget they're there, but they have a huge amount of power. And what can we do is I'm not going to do what they've already done, which hasn't worked. I'm going to ask some craftivists from across the UK, so not further afield like some of our projects, but because this was a UK company, I focused on the UK. And I focused on picking people who look like that company's audience because it's they're going to listen to their core audience of customers much more than maybe, you know, 15-year-old boys in black anarchist hoodies, for example. And I, I had, there's 14 board members, so I said to 14 craftivists that I knew were very thoughtful would spend a lot of time and energy doing something beautiful and gentle and I bought handkerchiefs from this company and I gave everyone a handkerchief and said I want you to look up everything about your board member look at what colors they wear look at what jobs they've had on LinkedIn are they a trustee of somewhere have they done any talks online you can listen to or podcasts or articles try and figure out what they're like as a human being and what they might care about and then on this handkerchief I want you to pick a timeless quote from someone you think they respect but the quote has to be about being the change they wish to see in the world but very timeless. And then the reason for the handkerchief was because it's a good metaphor. It's a a good visual to say, don't blow it. Use your power for good. We know you've got a really difficult job, but you've also got a real opportunity to shape our world and shape business. And this business is so influential with other companies that if you pay the living wage, others would too. But we kept the handkerchiefs very timeless as a gift. So it wasn't a manipulation. It wasn't yeah, a Yeah, it is so connective. It's it's a gift, but it's also... And it's a positive gift. So exactly. it's about encouraging them. And it was so much about encouraging them to do the best job they could. So I had very clear guidelines for my craftivists. To, I was you know, a bit of a dictator, but they were happy with that to say don't make it the 
it's not about what colors you like it's not about who you like it's about doing something that you think they'll love that they'll find as a useful tool not just in promoting the living wage but trying to be the best company that they can be part of and then we wrote handwritten letters to go with them that's focused on the living wage so it said while I was stitching, hand stitching your handkerchief, I was thinking about how difficult your job is and how impressive it is that you've been promoted into that role, but also what an opportunity you have and a responsibility. I was also thinking about how difficult it is for people to live on minimum wage, especially if they've got a family, often they'll need two jobs and it's very stressful. And as a customer, we love your staff and we're shocked that they're not paid a living wage and we think that you could be this incredible company that we will want to keep um being a customer of so it was very positive but it was challenging but challenging as a critical friend rather than an aggressive enemy and it comes in with the assumption that they're not bad people you know that they just have maybe other priorities and you're saying no 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 no. like we hope that you'll prioritize this among the other things that are important yeah and and that's good for us as well, you know, not in a selfish way, but in terms of sustainability, it's much better for us as human beings to presume that people are trying to do their best. We don't know if they've got something happening in their personal life that's affected how they see people differently. We don't, you know, we don't know the complexities of people, but it's much better for us to believe in people than to presume the worst. And one of the things is as well, and we never had to say it luckily, but it's that technique that you know our loved ones say you know if it's your mom or your dad or someone that looks after you when they say I'm not angry I'm just disappointed it's so much more powerful than someone screaming at you because what they're saying is I'm not angry I'm disappointed because you're better than this I know you can do beautiful stuff I know that you're a kind human being and I believe in you to do brilliant stuff so I'm not going to tell you what to do but I'm going to say I believe in you and you should believe in you too and the hankies were all around that so we hand delivered them with our cards and our handkerchiefs in boxes with ribbons and there's pictures in the book that show it all and the board were so moved. They were quite shocked. And then they were really moved. They looked at each other. So they were saying, what's on yours? What's on mine? They spoke to us. We were the chair of the board in the AGM in front of thousands of hundreds of people, including media, said in front of everyone, and it was recorded as well. He said how moved the board were by our gifts and how, of course, he will have a meeting with us, which was our goal was to have this one meeting And then within 10 months, we had lots of meetings with them because we built this trust and it was always about them having the power and how we could help them. Um, And then before the next AGM, they announced that they were paying the living wage to 50,000 staff. And what was good again with that was we didn't then suddenly go into what often we do as activists is go, yay, we won. Look what we did. We got this company to do this. We immediately, I said to all of the craftivists and people that we knew, we need to say well done to this company. Say on Twitter and Instagram, isn't this amazing what you've done? But also it would be even better if you became a living wage accredited company so that year on year they would guarantee um, that with inflation you're still paid a living wage. So it was it was all about encouraging them and then celebrating them and then challenging them lovingly to be even better. Um And Share Action and the Living Wage Foundation were, you know, I think they were a little bit dubious at the beginning and a bit like, this sounds sweet, but will it work? And we've totally won them over. Um, And a a lot of the language we use now, the charity sector in the UK talk about doing more open questions, talk about more nonviolent language. And that's the one of the reasons for the book is, you know, it wasn't just about giving handmade gifts that were crafted. It was about all of those other things, which I love about your podcast is it's so much about how do we put our principles into action. It's not just what colors we use. It's we, we use lots of yellows because it's hopeful colors, but it's all about encouraging people. It's about humility. It's about what you said, you know, presuming people are good human beings rather than presuming them that they're the worst. Um, it was all that wrapped into one. 
Oh my gosh. I just get goosebumps thinking about this. Like as I was reading the book, I was like, this is amazing. Cause it's, Aww. it's genuinely something that I don't think about. Like I, I would love to be like, yeah, this is something I already practiced, but no, like this is something that's so convicting for me because if anybody follows me on Twitter or Instagram, they know that I have been spending a lot of time communicating with my members of Congress and my senator, but I've been spending a lot of time you know, on the phone with them and their teams. And I even was in D.C. meeting with them recently. Um, I've got another meeting scheduled with my congressman. And it's interesting because all of my elected representatives, I like them. Like, I think they're decent people, but I don't agree with a lot of their principles, like on both sides of the political aisle. And so a lot of my messages and phone calls are me saying, hey, don't do that. Stop that. Like, you know, and it's, you know, there's maybe a place for that because part of me is like, hey, they're just like literally tallying phone calls. They're saying how many people called about this, how many people called about that. But I did find one of my senators, he cares a lot about fighting human trafficking. It's like one of his most passionate subjects. And that's not something that like comes up every single day in the Senate. Yeah. And so obviously like... And it's, it's not something that is going to help him in terms of career progression. No. So you know, his motivations are not for that reason. Exactly. Mm. And so I've started to really pay attention to his passion for that. And I've started calling and just calling his office and saying, hey, I noticed that you actually just submitted this bill uh, fighting human trafficking. I really believe in this. And I want to thank you for you know representing yeah. me and my state so well by doing this. And by starting to do that, you know, people on the other end of that phone line, whether or not they're like the actual senator, you know, they're usually not the actual senator. They're they're a staff member. They've started to, you know, soften up when I call. And so I can then call and be like, hey, I really don't think that, you know, this plan that you're about to vote for is a good idea, you know, for something completely unrelated. And they're a little bit more likely to listen. And so... And you're more memorable. They're more likely to go, oh, it's that Brendan guy. And I do it a lot with... I remember working for Oxfam where... There was, we always have a, for certain campaigns, we have a target list of which politicians are more influential in that area than others. And some of them would, would ignore us for lots of issues. And I remember saying to my team, um, this one person who's really influential on, and it was on um, the food system. He's really influential on that, but he's been ignoring everything else. And we've got a really bad relationship with him. So he's just, his team are just ignoring our emails and our requests. So is there anything he's done in the last two years that we can celebrate? So using your tactic of saying, what is it that we can say well done and thank you for? And my team were like, oh, he's a horrible person. He's probably done nothing. And we found something. We found something and we sent him a Valentine's card because it was around Valentine's Day saying, thank you for showing your love on this it's really brilliant. And it wasn't linked to our food campaign at all. And it wasn't an international development issue. But we got a reply from the office saying, thanks so much. It was a lovely handmade card and it means a lot. And then when we engaged with, there's a, a group in the UK called the Women's Institute, which are very politically influential and they have different branches all over the country. And I knew that they were influential, especially with this politician. So we made a food hamper with them and we did a big event and we said to the politician will you come and receive this hamper and because we'd given them this card they answered our request they were less fearful to come because we were much more friendly um, than demonizing him and it was mutually beneficial and you know that can sound like a cop-out in some ways of but most things do need to be mutually beneficial. You know, politicians are busy people, so they've got to be pretty ruthless. And the more you can engage them personally, emotionally, as well as the facts, but facts shouldn't drive things. It's about connection and about saying, how can we help you do the best job that you can? And I started doing the hanky project because my local politician was ignoring all of my email petitions so it was a real challenge for me to say and you know the people that we give gifts to are people we disagree with we don't give gifts to people that we agree with because it's not a good use of time and energy and resources so we target people we disagree with and we we try and find common ground but we also challenge people by saying look if if 
we agree that we want the world to be a more harmonious, healthy place, which most people agree with, then explain a little bit more about why you've chose to do fracking in this area, because that doesn't seem to fit the vision we want. But we might not know everything. And you're in a position of power where you probably do know more information. So let's have that discussion. So it's much more about those discussions and asking questions. And that's a gateway. You know, that's that's an intro. It's the beginning of a conversation, not the end. And we do that in every other way of life. Yet with that with activism, we often are immature. We end up having toddler tantrums and telling people what to do. When we know in every other part of life that that doesn't work, people go into fight or flight mode where they they're either get very defensive or aggressive. Yet why do, when it comes to activism, it's like all emotional intelligence goes out the window. I just find that really frustrating. <laughs> I mean, I think that's what's so beautiful about what you've created is that it feels very counterintuitive for people, but it's important. Yeah. And for me, it's all common sense of asking people questions, focusing on the the vision that we want rather than just the problem because our psychology, the way our brains work is if we have a vision of something, we figure out how to get there. If we just focus on the problem, our brains don't know what else to do. So there's lots in the book about what's the vision, how to get there, how to use the process of slow, repetitive hand actions through crafting to think deeply, empathetically, strategically, how, you know, all of the strengths of using craft in activism And some of it's universal and some of it's very specific to craft. But it comes back to what you said before about, for me, the the craft and the gifts are a catalyst. They're not the conclusion. They're not, if you make a hanky, everything will be fixed. Sadly, you know, after giving a hanky to my local politician, it took me months to build a relationship with with them where we could work together on some things and challenge each other on others. And, and I can't say that I changed her political ideology, but I can say that we worked with each other much better. I became a better lobbyist. Um, we saw where we could be of use to each other, where they would tell me lots of information out of trust. I would feed that into other organizations so that they had useful intel. So it, it's seeing craft as a tool and the craftivism is as one piece of the jigsaw you know I still go on marches I still make sure that I try and live ethically and intentionally with what I buy and how I treat people you know if someone says something racist at the bus stop I'm not going to go home and send them a cross stitch I'm going to immediately say like wow tell me more about that or that's really sad that you're, you feel attacked or, oh, I'm not sure I agree with you on that because my friend's this or, you know, try and do it in this loving way. But it is a practice. I don't think it is something that some people have and some people don't. You know, I've had to practice showing empathy to perpetrators, which I still find difficult. And I've had to practice focusing on the positive in the world and not just the negative. So it's, it's, a, it's a very ritualistic in lots of ways. But it's a much more fulfilling way that I feel like I am as an activist, as a sustainable, positive activist than, you know, running around, burning out and and being angry with everyone. Mm. And that's something that we have really tried to do ourselves when we created our good newspaper. We wanted it to be a celebration of what was possible and how people were creating that future hopeful possibility. You know, we would say, hey, there's this problem in the world. There's this injustice. It's heartbreaking. But here's here's a vision for where the world could be. And, and here's the stories of people bridging that gap. And the statistics are there to say, you know, we've halved poverty, oh, the Millennium yeah. Development Goal. Some of them were smashed out of the park and amazing. But our default and the culture we live in and the media that we see is this is all awful. So, you know, as global citizens we need to keep reminding people yes we're not belittling injustice but we shouldn't ignore the fact that throughout history we have made change you know women in the UK and America do have the vote and that's not going to go backwards hopefully it's the norm you know segregation doesn't exist in most parts because campaign and worked because protesters were there because people in parliament and in business made change you know we need change to happen in every 
orifice. You know, we need people banging on the doors of parliament, but we also need people in parliament trying to change it from within. We need all of these different angles. And I think for listeners, it's a, my challenge to listeners is to say, where's your circle of influence? Where are your gifts and talents? You know, as an introvert, I'm very different to my sister, who's quite an extreme extrovert. So we protest in different ways. You know, I love making things on my own. And she loves being around people as a social worker. So knowing that she's doing incredible work there, and my mum is now a politician, and, you know, knowing that friends are out there doing lots of very different, unique things, actually really helps me to know that I shouldn't try and do everything, but I can try and be the best jigsaw piece in this puzzle as possible in a sustainable, loving, positive, hopeful way. Um, We we all have impact whether we like it or not. So I think living intentionally and trying to see where you can make change with curiosity is actually really interesting. You know, being curious about who made your clothes can make you really excited about celebrating if you find some super ethical jumper that you every time you wear it you know the story behind it is much more fulfilling than buying something that you got in the sale that might fall apart in a few months and you don't know anything about where it was made and how it was made. I love that idea of leading with curiosity because I don't know. I think curious people are my favorite people and I think that when we go around the world thinking like you know, how could how could this thing be changed or who has the power to change this problem in the world? Then you start, you know, kind of going down this other rabbit trail of being like, you know, what would help this person change their mind about this? Or what's this person's life like on a day to day basis where they're not choosing to think about this? Like, why why isn't this already a priority? And how can I, you know, bridge that gap for them? The more that you go down that rabbit trail, the more you get to, okay, well, what can I do? Because I think it's easy to be like, they can make that vote, they can make that change. But if you keep on just asking why, then you get to yourself and you say, well, how can I, you know, push that first domino? Yeah. And curiosity is a very, for me, it's a very positive, exciting word, whereas questioning can sound quite aggressive and transactional. So I think, you know, as activists, people are like, yeah, 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 we should question everything. I'm like, no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying we should be curious, which means we should, yes, question thing, question our presumptions. But when we talk to power holders, we should say, okay, tell me about what's your vision for your company. Tell me about what you're in your job. Why did you become a politician? And you learn much more. And saying things like one of um, my friend, Rob Hopkins, set up the Transition Towns Network, who's an incredible human being. And he's got a phrase that I use all of the time now, which says, um, what if? So he doesn't start, his is all about tackling climate change and getting communities to do it on a local grassroots level. And he doesn't start with, we need to change this, this and this. He gets people to start saying, what if? So what if we lived in a community where pollution wasn't allowed and it was all renewable energies? What if we lived somewhere where we had our local currency? What if people of different religions got on? How would that look like? So the what if just opens up people's imaginations, makes people curious, makes people hopeful and and challenges you to think outside, you know, sometimes the barriers we put in ourselves. It's much more exciting. And I think if we can talk to people we disagree with by saying, well, what if that person that you just judged and, and stereotyped, what if they're not like that? What if they're different from what you think? You know, what if they marry your partner, your son? What if, um, you know, the what if and the curiosity, I think, is a much more exciting and playful and beautiful way to live in this messy world that we were in. All of this just is so energizing for me. Like, I'm just so excited to think about, like, what I can do and what we can all do for people who are leaving this conversation and they want to take action in a really practical way. How would you recommend that they start this idea 
of the art of gentle protest? How can they start implementing this in their lives? Well, sadly, it's not an easy answer because we're all in different contexts and on different journeys. I mean, at the back of my book, I have a well-making clinic, which is different questions of like, if you're feeling anxious, here's a good film to watch. If you're feeling in despair, here's a beautiful magazine or an action to take. So it's different for everyone. And that's one of the reasons I wrote the book was to have this, you know, very practical book, but full of stories and principles. So it's a nice read on the, the bus or the train. Um, but for me it starts with and it's what I get everyone to do it starts with what should I've got three things what's your daily life so what do you eat where's your energy supplier from you know how do you live your normal life and are there any changes you could make so can you change your energy supply into renewables can you buy more ethically if you can afford to if you can't afford to can you just write a letter to the producers say and you know as a customer I'd like you to change this so small things is your daily life I think we should all focus on and not just the big grand gestures um also look at your circle of influence so you might have a real passion around trafficking but you might also be the niece of a prime minister or you might work in you know a an energy company that you could change things within. So looking at your circle of influence, you might be a someone on Instagram that has a huge following and you can use that influence. And also looking at where your energy and your gifts and talents are. So as an introvert, I only realized a few years ago I was an introvert and it completely changed the way that I do activism. So I gain energy in certain ways rather than lose it. But also it helped me realize where I've got real skill in some areas and I don't in others. So it's not limiting me doing my activism. It actually makes me clearer on where I can be of use and be that useful jigsaw piece. So your daily life, your circle of influence and where have you got gifts and talents that you can use that's unique to you? I hope that empowers rather than overwhelms people. Yeah. But it's a start. And really. I think that's incredible. And And maybe one last note that I'd love for you to leave people with is, you know, what's the grand hope for the future? You know, if everybody took part in this art of gentle protest, what would the world look like? Well, for me, you know, you don't need to like craft to do craftivism. It's a tool and it's a useful tool. And, you know, the gentle protest is what's core to everything for me and looking throughout history, you know, I see gentle protest as really effective. So what I'd love people to go away with from listening to this podcast is that activism can and should be beautiful, kind and just. And the more beautiful and kind and fair it is, the more effective it is. So when people slip into transactional, aggressive activism, question it and say, is that strategic? Is there a more wonderful way of doing it? I want, I truly believe that activism can be beautiful, kind and fair. And that's what I would love everyone to do because we will always have injustice. But if we can compete with beauty and kindness rather than compete with more hate and more um, negativity, I think the world would be a wonderful place. I love this idea that we can discover the world of gentle protest if we pursue and believe in the what ifs and bypass cultural notions of activism. If you are left wanting more after this conversation, uh, I really encourage you to check out her book, How to Be a Craftivist. It's so good. You should also follow Sarah on Instagram and Twitter because her thoughts are brilliant and so helpful for me. And I would imagine that you will love them as well. And I'm just so grateful for the brilliance that is Sarah Corbett and craftivism. This podcast is created by me, Brandon Harvey, as a part of Good, 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 a community that believes in the power of celebrating good news and becoming good news. Chad Michael Snavely of the team at CM Studio edit and mix the show. You can find lots more hopeful stories on social media by following us everywhere at good, good, good CO. And as always, you can learn more about the work that we do at good, good, good and check out our good newspaper and our good newsletter and all of our old episodes by visiting us at goodgoodgood.co. 
And on that note, that is a wrap for this week's episode. Go out and do some good this week, and we'll be back next week with another inspiring story of an incredible person. Sound good?